Premier's statement, resumption of the adjourned debate. Speaker. Member for Vic Park. for you all. It is with immense honour and indeed some trepidation that I stand here today in this place as a member for Victoria Park. In that regard, let me begin by first of my hopefully many speeches by thank thanking the people of the electorate of Victoria Park for trusting me with the enormous responsibility for representing their interests in the State Parliament. I assure all my constituents that it is an honour that I do not take lightly and it is a job that I will undertake with the utmost diligence, enthusiasm and professionalism. I am very much aware that the previous member for Victoria Park, Jeff Gallup, spent the best part of 13 of his 20 years in Parliament on the front bench for the Australian Labor Party, five years of which as Premier of our great state. It is appropriate that I take this brief opportunity to reflect on my predecessor. Jeff spent 20 years representing my electorate and, in various capacities, our state. His commitment to Victoria Park was never doubted and was reflected in his massive support within the electorate. One of Jeff's legacies, and Ron Davies before him, is that I now represent a discerning electorate that has quite rightly become accustomed to high quality representation. Whilst I will no doubt forge a different path as the member for Victoria Park than Jeff, if I can emulate his passion and commitment to the electorate, then I am confident that I too can replicate his electoral success. I want to thank Jeff for leaving an electorate with high expectations of its member, and I look forward to spending every waking minute meeting these expectations and hopefully in the fullness of time ensuring that the member for Victoria Park again returns to the front bench for the Australian Labor Party. Formed in 1930, Victoria Park is one of our older electorates and to me it represents all the complexities, excitement and potential that are being experienced across our state and nation. It certainly is an economic and social microcosm of Australia. I have spent 15 years of my life living and observing the phenomenal changes to this inner city electorate that I now proudly represent taking in the suburbs of Victoria Park, East Victoria Park, Burswood, Lathlane, Carlisle, Welshpool, Cannington, Bentley, St James and Queen's Park, my electorate has all the demographics of our state. Traditionally, Victoria Park has been dominated by blue collar workers who, with their families, have grown up and retired in the electorate. Indeed, my neighbour Lena, of Italian descent, has spent 50 years in Victoria Park, raising her family and retiring on the same block of land. My former neighbour Vi, built in Lath Lane at a time when it was considered on the fringe of metropolitan Perth. My old boss Lou, who with his sister Helen have run their bottle shop in Carlisle for the last 17 years. When I worked with them we certainly had a very small uh, wine and beer collection. I think a good reflection exactly how we've changed as a nation and state and certainly the electorate is the, is the growth not only in wine uh, that we have there from all over the world but also an extensive boutique beer collection. And it is these people who are still active in the community and it's these people who will cast their discerning eye over my performance in this place. Consistent with world trends for inner city living, Victoria Park has experienced a large influx of young families and young professionals who have moved into the electorate, who have sought the advantages of living in an environment of character and history that is also conveniently located close to the CBD, Curtin University, the Swan and Canning Rivers, and with its own train line in a time when public transport is becoming more and more important to people. A short stroll along Albany Highway and its bustling cafe, restaurants and pub strip showcase Victoria Park's growing youthful culture, the generation to which I belong. And it is a clear display of what is happening across our state during these economic times. Young people with a sense of confidence about their place in the world. Additionally, the state government's commitment to redevelop parts of Bentley and Queen's Park in partnership with the local community ensures that our state's economic success does not stop at one end of my electorate. However, whilst door knocking and speaking with the thousands of people throughout my campaign, it is apparent that whilst the economic times are indeed bright, there is also pervasive insecurity, fear and concern that the impact of globalisation and the federal government's industrial relations laws mean that beyond the frivolity of conversation and laughter in the cafes and pubs, there is a looming gloom felt by many. I will return to this topic shortly. Yesterday I was sworn in as a member of the State Parliament of Western Australia. However, there was one unique and extremely significant difference to my swearing in than any other member of this place before me. I am the first member of Parliament for Western Australia, indeed the first member of Parliament of any state in Australia, to have sworn my oath of office to the people I represent, rather than to the Queen of Australia. 
With the passing of the Oaths, Affidavits and Statutory Declarations Act last year, we, as Members of Parliament, now have the choice to state where our loyalties lie. Preparing for this speech, I did read a number of uh, speeches, first speeches from all sides of the House, and I did note a common theme in respect of this, and I am delighted to, uh, to have the opportunity to choose. I by no means, however, wish to disparage the work of the English monarch. However, as a proud supporter of the Republican cause, there can be no doubt that the age of an unelected monarch on the other side of the world, symbolically heading our state and nation, should be long gone. There is no doubt, this is no doubt true in practice, and the fact that, as an Australian, I have and feel no bond whatsoever with the office of the British Crown makes me particularly proud to swear my oath to the people I account to rather than to Buckingham Palace. Globalisation has increased the intensity and speed at which worldwide activities impact on our everyday lives. We watch with great concern as decisions by transnational corporations impact on our lives regardless of what actions are taken by Australian governments. We watch as oil prices reach levels that mean that people in my electorate sacrifice other household expenses to keep their car on the road. Oil prices that are decided by perhaps the greatest economic cartel our world has ever known. People in my electorate watch concerned by the basic employment rights that we, as Australians, and have developed over a century and have come to know as the basic standards of living that we expect and would expect of each other have been sacrificed on an unsubstantiated argument that such sacrifice is necessary to increase productivity at a time when we, as a nation, have never been so productive. It is interesting to note that this year we'll be celebrating the 150th anniversary of the eight-hour day, a right that will soon be gone. I mention this fact and wonder, when the laws have finally sunk in, how much further back will we go? These laws are not a federal issue, they are a household issue, and I'll be reporting on the individual impact these laws have on everyone in my electorate and I'll be drawing the grim comparisons between what the federal government has taken away and what we, as a nation, as a people and society, have struggled for over 100 years to establish how we want to balance our lives. The current climate and generic process and impact of globalisation creates many exciting opportunities and, indeed, many challenges. How do we ensure that everyone in our state, from inner city Perth to all our distant regions, take advantage of these times? How do we, as members of parliament, continue to think global and act local, and what does that mean anyhow? How should government respond to globalisation? As this process restricts the role of government further and further to simply that of a regulator, we need to consider, if, th if this is the case, what role should government play to ensure that the operation of global markets do not leave people behind in poverty and without access to these advances of technology? It is these challenges that brought me here today as a member of the State Parliamentary Labor Party. It is my belief that one of the fundamental roles of government is to address inequality and injustice. In this tradition, the Labor Party is the party best placed to respond to these challenges. We are fortunate to enjoy the current commodity boom. Colleagues, enormous responsibility comes with these economic times. Today, our greatest responsibility is to develop a sustainable economy for Western Australia. We all know that our state is overly reliant on the resources sector. We know this. We cannot continue to rely on the growth of external countries to be the linchpin to fuel our own wealth creation. We know that, beyond the resources sector, there is, a, there is a Perth diaspora. Our greatest talents are leaving. Our talents in the arts, education, training, medicine, science are finding homes all over the world. What are we doing? It is this question that has brought me to this place. As someone who has benefited enormously from our community, it is incumbent upon me, upon all of us here, to ensure that we leave our community, our state, in a condition better than how we found it. We need to broaden our economic base. What I'm saying is not new. Indeed, the Industry and Technology Development Act recognises this issue. Section 3 states that the role of the WA Technology and Industry Advisory Council is to, amongst other things, encourage the establishment of new industry in the state, encourage the broadening of the industrial base of the state, and to promote an environment which supports the development of industry, science and technology, and the emergence of internationally competitive industries in this state. If I can, just way, by way of example, um, refer to the uh, uh, information and communications technology industry. The most recent article on the Technology and Industry Advisory Council website is titled Enabling Growth, the Contribution of Information and Communications Technology to the Western Australian Economy. 
This report indicates that information and communications technology has had a much more significant direct influence on productivity growth across Australia than initially expected. In Western Australia in 2004, revenue generated by this industry was estimated to be in excess of $6.6 .6 billion. It is interesting to consider that today the in this, this industry in is contributing 3.3 per cent to the state's gross output and thus is of a similar size to the combined agriculture, fisheries and forestries industries. I attended the Western Australian Information Technology and Telecommunications Award last Friday night and have first had knowledge as to how dynamic this industry is in WA and how the intelligence, commitment and passion of our players match the rest of the world. The Premier has emphasised the importance of broadening our economic base in his statement to this place on the 7th of March this year. And the fact that the Premier has retained the key economic portfolio of state development shows the commitment of the Carpenter Government to this issue. Similarly, the creation of a new portfolio of science of innova and innovation means that we have a Minister who has the particular responsibility for ensuring that we, as a state, remain on the front foot in respect of innovation. And whilst I'm in a congr congratulatory mood, I will also use this opportunity to mention the recent commitment by the State Government and the University of Western Australia of $50 million each for the construction of what will hopefully become two world-class biotechnology research centres in Perth. Whilst the term biotech is brandished around, it may actually be useful to define the term. A paper by Ron Johnston from the Australian Centre for Innovation and International Competitiveness, a paper that is also on the uh, Technology and Industry Advisory Council website, defines biotechnology as the use of living organisms or parts of organisms to create products or processes. Not particularly helpful for anybody other than a medical researcher. However, what I wanted to um, go on to say is that what is it that the State Government has just committed $50 million to? Mr Johnson goes on to state, biotechnology has created insulin and human growth hormone for the medical and health industry, insect resistant cotton and slow ripening tomatoes, improved rennet and food additives in the agriculture and food sector, it has provided bacteria tailored to break down specific environmental pollutants and to reduce sulphide ores to their oxides in the mining industry. Clearly, I need say no more as to the potential of the biotechnology industry. I see research and development, in particular in the areas of biotechnology, as the pointy end of what we, as a society and as an economy, need to focus. Western Australia has the potential to become the world leaders in biotechnology. Not only is it vital for the living standards of people all over the world, it is also a key area in which Western Australia has a solid reputation and can continue to grow. The feats of Barry Marshall, Robin Warren, Fiona Wood and Fiona Stanley stand as testimony to this fact. Whilst the Labor government is working hard in this area, there is no finishing line. We must always, always focus on this point. Focus on how and where we can ensure that we as a state do not need to rely on commodity cycles cycles that will inevitably turn against us to sustain us. How do we also strive for the balance of wealth and happiness? This is what we seek as a Labor government. How do we ensure that these economic times are used responsibly to ensure that our job as a state government, the deliverer of services, deliver these services effectively and efficiently? How do we ensure that all West Australians share in our economic wealth and have access to the basic citizenship entitlements such as education, health, power, water, environmental health and security. Now most people in this place know my father Cedric. He's in the house today and uh, represents much of what our state is and can be. Dad was born in Meekathara and taken as a young child to Sister Kate's, and interestingly enough the remains of which are in my current electorate. He ended up at Clontarf and ultimately his football talents took him to Aquinas where I also atten attended, although much of the consternation of the Christian brothers, I never emulated my dad's football skills. Dad worked hard, any bitterness and disappointment he had towards then government policy never stopped his commitment to social justice and to ensure that my sister and I received everything that was denied him, a loving and supporting family and an education that both my sister and I can claim is second to none. Dad is currently the coordinator of Jigalon Community, a community made famous by the movie The Rabbit Proof Fence and indeed Barry Marshall and Fiona Stanley have a close connection. I make regular trips to Jiglong and continue to be in order of the country where the Madu people live. To see this country just after the wet is exactly what the true meaning of God's country is. I want to take a minute to reflect on yesterday's discussion in this place on Halls Creek. I must say it must have been the presence of my dad in the gallery as I was not expecting such a passionate debate my first day in Parliament on this issue. The member for Meriden made a number of points in respect of Halls Creek 
and proposed a select committee in this regard. However, whilst I find uh, his commitment to this cause most admirable, I do not believe that this is the solution to the people, for the people in Halls Creek. Aboriginal people all over our country have been analysed to death on this point. And this was recognised by the member for Central Kimberley Pilbara. Let me say to all members here today, the solution will not be found in Halls Creek alone. As this issue is not Indigenous based, it is poverty based. We talked about the problems in Halls Creek, but the fact of the matter is that the issues faced by the community up there are the issues faced by Indigenous communities all over our state and country. We can spend all the money we want on Halls Creek, but until we understand that when the mob from, from Balgo or Mika Thara or Roburn or from wherever they come from descend on Halls Creek, then the already, already inadequate services simply collapse. And the question has to be asked, why have other mobs descended on Halls Creek? Because those communities are also dysfunctional and have nothing to support them. We cannot solve the problem in Halls Creek without taking a statewide view on this point, a statewide structural view. And I'll return to this point again shortly. Jigalong, like hundreds of others, is a community afflicted by abject poverty, a community not unlike many others, often located in regions that produce immense wealth for our nation. The uh, consultants Asel Tasman recently did a uh, report for Rio Tinto, and they produced two interesting statistics. In 2004-2005, the Pilbara produced $12.9 billion in exports and received approximately $53 million of those money within the Pilbara itself less than half of 1%. Out of the royalties and taxes produced by that $12.9 billion, less than 1% was returned to local government. However, it is clear to me that the problems facing communities such as Jigalong and Halls Creek are not issues that can be quarantined to the portfolio of Indigenous affairs. As I said before, these are issues of poverty, poverty that many Australians would be horrified to see exist in our country in our times. Those of us fortunate enough not to experience poverty, real poverty, are often confused as to what this term means. It does not simply mean material deprivation. Poverty of the kind that is passed from generation to generation is exclusion, a lack of power and respect, and more often than not, afflicted on people who are controlled and bullied by the welfare machine. Mr Speaker, may I have an extension of time? Uh, extension granted. This is why globalisation has exacerbated isolation as those in poverty, often termed outsiders, are further removed from this process and, accordingly, poverty becomes further entrenched and much harder to fight. The gap between rich and poor is widening. The rich may be getting richer, but the poor is in retreat and decline. Whilst the globalisation of our economy has created enormous wealth, it has also become a great social isolator. At the same time as the inner city areas are experiencing unsurpassed wealth, the poor, both rural and metropolitan, are falling further and further behind, isolated and forgotten and angry and suspicious of the process that has cast them aside. It is upon this basis that I want to see the Indigenous debate proceed. Proceed on the basis that it is a poverty issue, a social isolation issue, and not a simple case of an Aboriginal welfare issue. This is another reason why I stand here as a Labor Member of Parliament. It is the Labor Party that has traditionally represented the poor and marginalised in our community. And it's consistently amazed me that most country seats at a federal level are held by the Conservative parties. The retreat of services from the regions, from the banks to, the te to telecommunications in the pursuit of profit, has exacerbated this social isolation of rural communities and is unlikely to cease once Telstra is finally sold. We must, as parliamentarians, accept the proposition that not everything we provide must be based solely on what makes economic sense. Most Australians are happy for governments to provide a service that may not pay for itself, provided it is a service that is essential and provided responsibly. And it is again in this context that we must look to Indigenous issues. Indigenous development should be seen in the context of overall regional development. I look forward to working with the Minister for Indigenous Affairs and her department and hopefully encourage a sharper focus of its roles and responsibilities and importantly define exactly what we as a government and as a parliament want to achieve in this portfolio area. I served on the National Board of Indigenous Business Australia. The work of IBA is, quite simply, to promote Indigenous economic development. Through this work, IBA has grown its non-recurrent funding from $40 million to $110 million in a highly diversified portfolio. Each investment has an Indigenous community partner. IBA's website states, we see the accumulation of assets and participation in the mainstream economy is one of the significant opportunities for Australia's Indigenous peoples. It is also a means of ending the poverty to which so many of our people are subject 
and that so often ends in unacceptably high levels of poor health, rates of imprisonment and a number of other social problems being experienced in our communities. Again, the issue is poverty. It is my firm belief that the Aboriginal cause sits hand in glove with the regional development cause. Unless we can bring real economic benefits to our remote Indigenous communities, and we on IBA managed to successfully do this in a number of remote communities across Australia, then we will not be able to provide real alternatives to the current levels of poverty currently being experienced. As the Director of IBA, I was invited to attend a number of the State Government's regional investment tours. These tours take financiers and private equity experts from the city into the regions across our state and aim to marry up regional business operators and entre entrepreneurs with potential investors and, importantly, act as an educational device for business people in the regions. The success of these tours and the commitment of their organiser, Kevin Strapp, cannot be disputed. The first round of these tours between 2001 and 2004 resulted in 113 projects being presented to the tour with an investment to date of over $170 million into regional Western Australia. These tours and the work of IBA are a fine example that there is a real economic alternative to the isolation and retreat from our regions. And I look forward to the next regional investment tour, and perhaps I may not be joining it, um, but I'm delighted it's going ahead in the gold fields, I believe, in May. And whilst my priority is to the constituents of Victoria Park, my foundation in the gold fields ensure that I have an extensive network of friends and family across the regions. Accordingly, I'm a great friend of our regions and of our mining sector. The Perth diaspora I referred to earlier is in reverse in one particular area, resources. We are at the cutting edge in technology in this area and attract the best talent from across the world. The private resources sector is leaping ahead of state and federal government in respect of developing relations with Aboriginal landowners, local content and employment and environmental consideration. This fact is often lost in the heat of debate. Looking to current best practices within this sector may well teach us, as parliamentarians, a great deal. I look forward to working closely with the engine room of our state as a member of this place. I just want to make some brief remarks on the value and importance of education in our society. An education, be it university-based or skills-based, is the one great social equaliser. Thanks to the commitment and hard work of my parents and the generosity of the Rotary Ambassadorial Scholarship, I stand here today a very fortunate recipient of amazing educational opportunities both in Western Australia and in the United Kingdom. These benefits should not be destined for the lucky few, but continue as the basic building blocks of our society, regardless of background. A strong education will ensure that we as West Australians can meet our own aspirations, can strive to better ourselves in a global environment of great change. The delivery of a strong education system is the responsibility of state government, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to enter this place, to aid in this delivery. I want to work with the Carpenter government to continue its work to ensure that our public education system rebuilds itself so that our best will again come from these schools and that our training remains relevant, consistent and highly competent. Our federal system initially provided our state government with broad powers to legislate for the peace, order and good government of our state. Key areas, defence, immigration, foreign affairs were quite correctly made the responsibility of the Commonwealth. But it was initially viewed that the state government would legislate on the majority of issues. Without a lengthy lecture on, lecture on constitutional law, and I know you'd all love me to give you one, clearly our federal structure has changed and in some cases for the better. The beauty of our federal system is that it, it is flexible and can adapt as the complexity of governance changes. However, we, as members of parliament, need to consider exactly what federal structure we want and what is the role of state governments. I am encouraged by the position taken by Premier Carpenter, as I have long held the view that it is pointless to fight with the federal government for political purposes. If we can, at the very least, negotiate an outcome in the best interest of our state, then it is important that we have a constructive relationship with the federal government. However, with our current federal system under attack, we need to consider the capacity for the state government to promote the renewal of governance. It may well be that this capacity lies within the regions. As a state, we are quite well defined by our regions, whether it be the Kimberley, the Goldfields, the Murchison, the Pilbara or the Great Southern. Perhaps we need to consider how we increase governance at these levels to promote more interests in the governance structures to reduce the social and economic isolation so many of our fellow West Australians experience. I do not mean to dwell on challenges. However, to be a member of this place means that we need to ensure that we rise to meet and overcome such challenges. We, as a state, are in fortunate times. We, as a state, live in a community where there is still remains a sense of society, a sense of belonging. However, we must nurture and protect these times and ensure that these times are used to provide for the long-term future of us all. 
To have the honour of being elected as a Member of Parliament has been a long-term goal of mine, as I firmly believe that it is this place that still, despite the vagaries of our global economy, continues to be the true place that Western Australians look to to ensure that our interests as a state are met, maintained and protected. My campaign was based on an overwhelming sense of optimism and hope for my electorate and our state. Whilst there is always more to be done, we are a lucky state in fortunate times. However, it also became apparent that there is in our community a disturbing sense of cynicism towards our elected representatives at all levels of government. Whilst not the sole contributing factor, I have no doubt that this was partly to blame for the low turnout at the election that saw me elected to this place. Only 61 per cent of eligible voters cast a ballot. As a member for Victoria Park, one of my priorities will be to re-engage with these people who feel let down or somehow ignored by our political process. To be a successful MP in modern times is more and more difficult. We need to be aware of local, state, national and international events and issues. We as MPs need to be more aware of our community and other communities. As state members of parliament, we must ensure that we meet best world practices as members of parliament. If we expect to seek the support of our electorates and seek to provide the best possible services to our state, it is important that we know what other states and other countries are doing in this regard. Now, many of you may know that I'm a lawyer by trade and uh, I recognise that I've chosen uh, to pursue politics and law um, and one day, no doubt, I'll retire and start selling used cars. <laughs> Actually, apologies, I have many uh, car salesmen in my electorate and uh, they are held in much higher regard <laughs> than I ever was as a lawyer. However, I do love being a lawyer and being able to assist others in my work. I have worked with some amazing people from all over Australia, both as clients and colleagues and the experience has provided me with an invaluable insight into Australian society, in the corporate world and the social justice world. However, as a lawyer, one of my great concerns is the slow distancing of the justice system from our community. It is apparent that the political system is in a long-term crisis of confidence. However, we are aware of this, and hopefully we are working to reverse this trend. Door knocking my electorate, it is clear that our legal system is held in much the same regard as our political system. However, by and large, our lawyers seem to think this has simply manifested itself in the usually quite clever lawyer jokes. I have experience as a lawyer both in the commercial and public sector and it is quite apparent that the practice of the law in the large private law firms has become much more focused on the business rather than the law. The number one priority is the billable hour. Unfortunately, the billable hour has no relationship whatsoever with outcomes achieved for the client. The nature of a large practice is such that clients sought are only large corporate organisations as it is only these clients that can afford access to high quality and well-resourced legal advice and representation. As a lawyer with the state DPP, I was fortunate to have my faith in the legal profession restored by the commitment to, of all the lawyers in this office to the public good. While some individual lawyers within the commercial sector do have the goodwill and desire to try and ensure an element of community interaction, I fear that the commercial business of these practices make it utterly incompatible with community involvement and contribution. I propose to regularly make comment in this House as to how the community commitment within these firms actually works, as opposed to what may be on their website or on their various marketing brochures. It is apparent to me as a lawyer and as a very new Member of Parliament that access to justice is a long, expensive and intimidating process. More often than not, people only need short-term advice on everyday issues. The legal system is often the only means by which people can achieve an equitable and fair outcome. As each day goes by and our world gets more complicated, we need to recognise that if what we do in this place is complicated for those trained in it, how must it appear for those that are not? The justice system is the bastion by which we can ensure that those less knowledgeable in the process can access their own advice and have their cases advocated and concerns met. Finally, it falls upon me this afternoon to thank those that helped me become the member for Victoria Park. There are many, many people in this group, I would estimate 200, met some of whom are here today, um, but sadly I cannot list them all, so I will list just a few. But I wanted everybody to know that I will never be able to thank you enough for the commitment and support that I received. To Kate Doust, my campaign manager, you perform miracles of organisation in an environment of tight time frames and high stress. You ensured that I was occupied 100% uh, of the time and became a close confidant on all things electoral and fashionable. Thank you. To Bill Johnson, my campaign director, thank you for your support and considered advice based on years of knowledge and a Kate and Bill's children, Liam, Zoe and Rebecca, who for six weeks had me sitting at their breakfast table each morning, something that no child should have to endure. My apologies. Uh, the house. I'm standing on 102. I move that the amendment be given extra time.
time to continue his remarks? His permission granted. The question is he'll be given an extension in up to 15 minutes. As, um, those of that have been say aye. Aye. Against no, the ayes have it. To Reese Harley, Michael Watts, Raby Wild, Pam, Ray, Matthew and Varun, thank you for all for an amazing job where nothing was left undone and I was conveyed to each place regardless of time or effort and the phones in my campaign office were always manned. To the State Parliamentary Labor Party, in particular Shelley Archer who prepared a breakneck door knocking schedule, thank you all. Your support was incredible and for a nervous and often stressed candidate, invaluable. To the federal members, in particular Kim Wilkie, whose appetite for the shameless kept me out in the wee small hours of every day. To Julian and Leslie Grill, who have known the Wyatt family since I was a small boy in Kalgoorlie and who have provided me with long hours of political debate and advice. Thank you. Howard Peterson, who worked for my dad for many years and has been fortunate enough to continue working with me and providing me with hours of political argument. Thank you very much. To the Premier, Alan Carpenter. As a candidate, it was a privilege to have your personal support for me, both through the pre-selection process and the campaign. By-elections are particularly tough for incumbent governments and the candidate, and your day-to-day -day involvement ensured that the people of Victoria Park had a Premier serious about what they had to say and a campaign team that was always motivated. To my family, Mum, Dad and Kate, I will not be here without your love, patience and support and continuous stream of advice despite the fact that you should all know by now that I do know best. <laughs> Mum and Dad, I stand here today utterly indebted to you both as you both ensured that I received an education that I never appreciated until it was all over. Thank you. To my sister Kate, your amazing strength and confidence over the last challenging year will inspire me for many years to come. And if you can defeat the last year, then nothing is impossible. And finally, to my fiance Viviane, uh, nobody should have to put up with what uh, you've put up with over the last few years. I proposed to Viv on Boxing Day last year, unprepared and without a, without a ring. I still have no ring. <laughs> but I'm reminded regularly that I have no ring and will promise you, honey, it is forthcoming. <laughs> to all the members of this place, regardless of your particular political persuasion and regardless of the fact that I may disagree with you on many points, on one issue I can guarantee that as long as I'm a member here, I will listen to and work with you all with the respect I have as contributors to our civil society in perhaps the toughest way possible. Thank you.